David Heldreth, it is so great to have you on the show. Welcome to Hemp Barons. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a little bit since we've uh, spoke, so it's good to catch up. Wonderful to catch up. And as I was saying to the producer here, Dan Homestin of MJ Bulls, uh, when we look at the Zees Farms website and it says, feeding the country with hemp, try the first federally legal hemp foods. I told him, you know, when your average entrepreneur just coming into this space says something like that. Those of us who are very sophisticated with law and regulation say, oh boy, what this, what's this misguided person saying? But when David Heldreth makes a statement like that, you can be guaranteed uh, that it is backed up with an intense level of a sophisticated understanding and strong, strong command of the legal uh, and regulatory considerations involved in a statement like that. So let's get right back into it here. Zeese Farms, tell me what it is that you're doing right now at Zeese Farms and what uh, makes it so revolutionary what you've been able to accomplish in terms of the particular type of food product you're making. Um, so basically, we're focusing uh, on utilizing the hemp leaf as a food item um, because it's something that's often, I feel, ignored in, in the, the cannabis industry. That The seed obviously has the, the value for oil, for um, protein extract, typically uh, fiber people are aware of, and then obviously the cannabinoids, the flour. Um, and the leaf seems to be to kind of ignore it. What's interesting is it's actually very high in protein. Uh, it's something that um, once you realize that it also has all of the essentials similar to the seed, which isn't surprising considering it's the same plant. Um, and so you start to see that there's this whole use of it, and you could go from microgreens to adult. Um, and then we've been working with the FDA on being approved since I've actually been working with them since prior to the farm bill being passed. Um, and initially, they wouldn't even speak to me about the concept of it because it was cannabis, and cannabis was a controlled substance still at the time when I started the process. So I know you know how that goes. So it's, it's just been a, a lot of work. Originally, to talk about the idea, I had to just speak about it in general as if it was a new plant species that was going to be used for leafy greens, just to see what technical information they would require. So let's unpack that, David. Um, prior, of course, to the enactment of the 2018 Farm Bill, we had the 2014 Farm Bill, and it had created this definition for industrial hemp for the first time in U.S. history to, to distinguish it from other forms of cannabis. And uh, it was defined very broadly, very clearly, it said. Industrial hemp is the plant cannabis sativa L and any part of such plant, whether growing or not, that does not contain greater than 0.3% delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol on a dry weight basis. Now, one would think that the term any part was very clear. We could take an, a plant that you grew, a hemp plant, give it to a four-year-old under the 2014 Farm Bill and say, here, four-year-old, uh, what part of, you can play with any part of this plant. What part of this plant can't you play with? And the, and the four-year-old would say, what do you mean? I can play with a whole part of the plant, any part of the plant. That's what you just said. And we'd say, you are right, four-year-old. You can play with any part of that plant as long as it's grown in compliance with an ag pilot program, right? But if we took that same plant that you grew, David, and gave it to a DEA agent who, of course, was informing the FDA and said, you can play with any part of that plant, DEA agent, what part of that plant can't you play with? They would say, well, the flowering tops and the leaves and the resin, of course. And we sat there scratching our heads going, what on earth does any part of that plant somehow translate to you as except the flowering tops and the leaves and the resin? Now, of course, that was a inflated idea um, that the DEA had, uh, but in the 2018 Farm Bill, of course, that uh, definition of hemp dropping the industrial was well expanded to ensure that we really do mean any part of the plant, including the seeds thereof, its extract, cannabinoids, uh, derivatives, isomers, salts of isomers, etc. So having said that, as you know, with every single ingredient that is put into the mouths of a animal or a human in the United States, it must uh, be either generally recognized as safe um, or have other qualifications to it. Now, currently, from my understanding, and I'm so excited for you to enlighten us further, with regard to the hemp plant, the items that have been deemed generally recognized as safe or GRAS, G-R-A-S, uh, and I'm saying this for the listeners, David is well familiar with all of this stuff, are the hold hemp seeds, the protein powder, and the hemp seed oil. And 
what I think I'm learning here from you is that the leaf has also been deemed grass or am I missing something? Because I know that it would set the world on fire and it, if that announcement came out, but perhaps it's more of a quiet announcement. What's the status there, mister? So we're still working on the on the grass finding with them, but what's basically happening is that we're getting an allowance for the use as a food item, uh, a conventional food item, which is actually separate from a food additive uh, use or and also uh, won't try our grass finding. We can't be used, for example, if you can't make a juice because that would be extraction, and so or you know, and we need a grass finding. There are limits to what we can do. We are only allowed the fresh item. Wow, amazing though. This is amazing though that you have uh, continued down this far. So, for example, um, and let me just ask this way as I expand my own knowledge base based on uh, the work that you've done here with hemp. So a food product could be, of course, the grain itself, a hemp seed without the hull taken out. So I guess that is just a fresh food. I go into the field and I've done it many times and there are these gorgeous nutrient dense seeds and I pick it off the plant and I put it in my mouth. I enjoy the taste and I know how many wonderful nutrients that that seed is delivering to my body. Whereas versus the hulled seeds, uh, which have been processed minimally, but still the hulls have been taken out, right? And, uh, and, and then cleared, cleared off. So we, we certainly don't like to see hulls in our bag of beautiful, nutty flavored, creamy hemp hearts. Um, and then for the protein powder, clearly quite a bit of processing went into that because we've now pressed oil, we've taken the seed cake, we've milled it, we've sifted it, etc. And the same thing with the oil, we've processed it. We have uh, pressed the, the seed itself for the oil. Where is that seed that I picked off the plant on the farm with the help shell still on it, that hasn't been processed at all. Am I on track here with what you're trying to demonstrate to us? With yeah, you? essentially, essentially. Uh, and so basically, um, it's something that I'm trying to get the FDA to announce publicly more widely because it's something that's being, because in internal communication, we've gotten this answer from them, which, but it's not something that they've announced pu very publicly so we have documentation of this but it's it's something that i believe is going to be announced as the part of when they announce the final uh hemp plan from the fda uh with which uh the they were announced was being reviewed by the white house in uh, was that august when they announced? Yeah, yeah 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 i I, I, I don't know um, and so there's because of that, there's this whole stall on announcements. And then with the transition between the current administration and the next administration, I believe that that's then further stalled that. And so there's going to be, there's a lot coming on this front and it's, we're in a real, it's a strange holding pattern right now <laughs> because of the administration You're changes. Indeed, indeed. Um, you know, I am uh, the vice president of law and science mm. for the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, so we are obviously knee deep in all of these things and having these conversations uh, as well. Of course, HR eight one seven nine has been put into uh, play, uh, which was written with um, the Dietary Supplement Coalition, the U.S. Hemp Roundtable and Dietary Supplement Coalitions, and very grateful for uh, Representatives Morgan Griffith and Kurt Schrader for their leadership on those, of course, as you know, that will need to be refiled, um, get a new bill number, but we're already up to 30 uh, co-sponsors. All of that dovetailing with what the OMB has right now, the Office of Management and Budget, um, which of course is, is the White House uh, with regard to those draft regulations, but just so very much um, in play. Having said that, once again, I know David Heldreth's uh, professional integrity. So when he is saying, uh, uh, try the first federally legal hemp leaf food. There's documentation somewhere, and yes, on the on the internal communications. It, I'm so thrilled for you, brother, that you are, are achieving this, that you are pushing this forward and leading the way. As we well know, hemp can feed the world, um, and. 
uh, we're talking about our farmers here. We're talking about trying to provide and, and in fact, delivering on the promise of providing uh, economic stability for our farmers while also making the world and humans and animals um, a healthier place and healthier living beings. Now, let's talk for a minute about the difference between going through this approval for humans versus going through this approval for animals that's amazing um we're actually in that process as well um i'm sure you've heard about the university so i'm sure you've heard about the university of kansas project on this currently for animal feed right oh absolutely and i believe the hemp feed coalition is is involved with that as well and so we've been providing samples of the varieties that we're developing for humans to consume because mm -hmm. we're searching for higher pro developing higher protein no cannabinoid because while some people obviously want cannabinoids there's a definite segment of the market that wants nothing to do with them but we can still provide them hemp that's high in protein and other nutrients without having the cannabinoids so we're developing these varieties and then we're actually providing hemp to to that trial as well um and so it's it's amazing to start seeing some of that data i mean COVID has definitely sidetracked um, a lot of things this year for everybody, um, but we've still been making progress on all these fronts, which is amazing considering everything that's happening. See, seeing um, how um, delicate the world's balance can be, it's great to see that this industry has still been able, I mean, I guess it's just that we've had to fight against things for so long that this doesn't seem so different than normal for the cannabis industry. Yes, that is so true. And, and in so many ways, we're used to it. And it, and it's just, you know, I'm going to get hippie on you here and and quote Joni Mitchell in the song Woodstock. You know, maybe it's just the time of year or maybe it's the time of man. It is the time of humanity. Having said that, a lot of folks do think that it's a, a cannabis, these very hurdles that we need to jump through uh, to prove safety. And the reality is that unless these things have already been in the food supply and a heat process, et cetera, whether in the food supply, meaning if we're talking about a new dietary ingredient, um, et cetera, uh, you could be a dandelion if you didn't, if you were a new dietary ingredient or otherwise not already generally recognized, you're going to go through all of the same steps, whether there's a cannabinoid in you or not. I think a lot of folks um, find it interesting to know AFCO, of course, which is um, a, a division of FDA responsible for animal feed, to even get one ingredient, and by that I mean, and this is the great work that the Hemp Feed Coalition is doing, um, even just to get hulled hemp seeds, that's one ingredient. Protein powder, hemp protein, that's another. Hemp seed oil, that's another. Uh, your hemp leaf, that's another. We, we need to do applications per ingredient per species. So an ingredient and one for pig, an ingredient and one for horse, an ingredient and one for bovine, right? The only animals that AFCO allows uh, you to combine per ingredient are cats and dogs, presumably because we don't eat them in this country. That's, and a concern being bioaccumulation, I suppose, and other things that happen um, to animals that we actually eat and then how that uh, how that affects the human body. Um, so are you working with AFCO uh, at all or you're working with AFCO through the University of Kansas? We're working with the University of Kansas and then AFCO. There's still a lot of data that we have to collect. I've been I reached out to them several years ago on this front um, and was trying to supply a lot of because there's a lot of this data. A lot of the data already exists on some of these topics, but it's Yes. piecemeal studies across and so i was trying to create a portfolio of evidence but it, there just wasn't enough for them and so then it's like where the like the holes would we need to bridge and then there but now like the university of kansas has been doing some of the research it has grants from the usda and that's the kind of things that we need from the federal government to provide um grants like that so that way we can start solving these problems and like you said there's all of these different ingredients and each one needs an approval in every species. And I think it's interesting is that while hemp seed and all these things are allowed for humans, they're not generally allowed for many animal species yet. A lot of this still has to be done, which is so interesting um, to me. And then also it's just the market for that is so big, but you're right about the bioaccumulation because as they accumulate it and then it further accumulates in us over time, it's like almost a double exposure. So it kind of makes sense that they would be protective over those mar those um populations it's it's going to be interesting in addition to the afco route there's actually similar to the grass route but for animal feed for the fda or it's a, i can't remember if it's that or it's the food additive petition as well so you don't everything has to go through the afco but it's typically easier so that's usually the way 
uh, the easier way to go. I think if it's through AFCO, then it's one that anyone can use as well. Attention cannabis podcast listeners. You can now listen to your favorite cannabis podcast ad free with the MJ Bulls mobile app. Just download the free MJ Bulls mobile app to your smartphone to start enjoying cannabis podcasts with no commercials. Go to Apple Apps or Google Play to get the MJ Bulls Cannabis Podcast app today. It's a very, very complicated process, and that's part of why it's so, yeah, you know, as you, you're like, Joy, cry, tell me all about it, sister. It is definitely a very complicated process. Um, there isn't a single hemp ingredient yet uh, that has been approved, not, not a single one just yet, um, but we are so close to getting there. Each application, you know, is, is uh, quite costly, but we, um, and, and certainly the reality is that for hundreds of years. I mean, we have, clearly we have been feeding since probably 1619, uh, if not before in the Jamestown colony, we're, you know, feeding, um, using hemp to, to feed people and animals. But here we are today after a uh, sort of um, sleepy, a sleepy slumber of, of prohibition of the plant and having to, you know, reprove ourselves in a way. Let's talk about Washington State for a minute, if we could. Zeiss Farms um, is based in Washington State. Is that right? Currently, yes, but a lot of, um, we're partnering with farms in other states because of some of the difficulties we're having in Washington. Well, so Washington, David, uh, I love the state of Washington. I've raised my sons here who are now making their way through master's programs. We moved here when they were young. I moved to 1998 uh, when medical cannabis was legalized through an initiative of the people as opposed to legislation. And then, of course, in 2012, a glorious year, we legalized adult use cannabis uh, in the state of Washington, again, through an initiative of the people. And it took another four years to legalize the cultivation of hemp under an agricultural pilot firm. So in March of 2016, finally, through an act of legislation, we legalized um, the planting and harvesting of hemp. Um, having said that, we've got two different sets of concerns, and we could probably go all day on subsets, but keeping it sort of simple for the listeners here, one is the state of Washington um, basically discusses cannabidiol or a hemp extract, so to speak, uh, that it may not be marketed as a dietary supplement or a food here in the state of Washington. That in fact, when we talk about extracts or cannabidiol, um, that they can only be marketed, these products, as a cosmetic uh, here in Washington. That's one issue that sort of continues to become a sticking point. And the other, um, the high level issue would be the fact that the U.S. Department of Agriculture post-2018 Farm Bill um, has put forth regulations for state plans and states can be more restrictive than the regulations prescribed by the USDA, but they cannot be less restrictive. And this has really caused quite a problem around the, and, and we know that the DA, and we know this because Secretary Sonny Perdue testified before Congress, and we've got him on videotape saying it, God bless him, that the DA really interfered with this process and was no fan of the entire program to begin with. But due to the DA, DEA inter DEA's interference, we have some nearly untenable uh, harvesting and testing requirements that that not only affect the hemp extract industry, but clearly affect an industry involved in microgreens and hemp leaf sales. Can you elaborate for us? Oh, definitely. It's, it's, it's intriguing. Um, so there's a few ways in terms of production, but the, the simplest way is that almost the USDA rules, which right now are delayed because of the recent spending bill for a year, which is helpful. Um, but most states have switched to it. But basically what the rules are requiring is that they essentially require you to have a flower to test for uh, THC concentration to ensure that you're below the 0.3% THC is required by law. Well, that's fine. But what if you're not cultivating a plant that's ever going to get to a flower? What? <laughs> and, and then so you're kind of then unable to get a harvest certification, which Washington State uh, requires for you to be able to harvest your crop, which is required, under, again, under the USDA plan as well. Um, 
I mean, there's theoretically times when you might harvest fiber and you may not need to you to, to have a flower. It's just um, an oversight in in the plan. One, so it makes it uh, essentially illegal to harvest microgreens. Washington State did a pilot with us this year where we did it. Um, they allowed us to last year because it was under the 2014 bill, <laughs> and then it switched, and so we couldn't this year. Um, but they did a pilot for testing to gather data um, to basically demonstrate that it's there's no possible way to exceed 0.3 at that point, <laughs> um, which which makes it kind of funny. Um, but then also, thankfully, I bugged the USDA enough about this uh, and was able to speak with the head of the program, uh, the head program there. And if you look at the when the USDA reopened their comment this year, there's specifically a section for hemp microgreens, clones and seedlings. That's because I told them, I said, well, how under these rules, how are you able to harvest a clone? Because that harvesting is happening before it's flowered. So that or moving a seedling off of location, all of these things fall outside of the scope of this harvest protocol. That And so are they all illegal? I mean, you, that seems ridiculous. And not the intent. It, and not the intent of either Congress or even the USDA. It, not even their intent. They again, they got side blinded in so many ways by the DEA, but continue because this is the stuff that lights me up and what tremendous work you've done. Continue. And so basically I had to essentially almost be like, I don't want to like have to sue or something, but it just doesn't seem right. And like, how do we resolve this? It like, and basically the USDA is just telling people to ignore the rule when it's things like that. That's literally their answer right now is trying to get states to just ignore these types of problems because they don't have an answer. And so, but the thing is, is the states won't. And so right now you have the situation where even though they've delayed the program for a year, the USDA rule implementation, Washington state still won't allow us. They're working and changing, which I get it, technically the rules. And so they're, they're working to amend everything so we can, but that's not a quick process in regulatory rulemaking. And so, and then same thing, USDA is doing the same thing right now from taking that comment. And so eventually, again, but because of new, like, new whole division knows when that plan will be. So all the changing current time, technically it's like this weird gray area where the states that are 2014 built, we, that we could in, but the other hand, it's so range. And so I'll let you run for Yes, no, no. It is really, again, asteroids hitting meteor. Uh, this is a, a plasma of an emerging industry. And and by the way, these types of weird oddities and, and inconsistencies and incongruities, they're not unusual for any emerging industry. But indeed, an, an industry that's coming off the heels of hysterical prohibition for several decades has uh, has some unique challenges. But even just a regular emerging industry, this kind of thing gets crazy with enforcement um, Etc. And and that is what is so frustrating um, is that the states, including the state of Washington, uh, you know, has chosen to listen. Even the FDA, it, because they've not actually ever done a a final agency action or a final determination. This has not been tested in the courts. Their guidance with regard to CBD and I, I you know, CBD does tend to take up all the air in the room, and and so it's even making its way into our conversation about for goodness sake and you're not even in that industry um but the but as an example you know it's a guidance position it's actually not the law and the fda can say a shout from the rooftops that their guidance position is that it is a violation of federal law to market cbd as a dietary supplement or a food the reality is that they know that it is uh no final agency action no formal discretion and that is why the industry has been allowed to just exponentially grow under that guidance position if tomorrow the formal guidance position, the formal uh, final agency action comes down, then that would obviously change the world and, and on its axis it would turn. But we know that it isn't going to because that's another um, regulator 
Stephen Hahn, who we have uh, on tape testifying before Congress that it would be a fool's errand. They're not going to, quote, not going to tell people not to take these products. And so now here you have with the USDA and they're they're being good. They're being kind. They're being um, helpful to the farmer, to the small business person, which is their job. And they're saying, you know what? We get it. There's a there's something that's incongruent here, but you should be able to move forward. So just move forward. And you've got the state saying, oh, well, the, the letter of the law says, or the letter of the guidance position states, or the letter of the sampling protocol says, um, and not being able or willing to move um, with with that sort of conflict between what I won't say um, is state and federal regulation, rather state and federal enforcement um, discretion. So very, very interesting stuff. Will you talk to us about the microgreens? Because certainly, and some other ways that humans eat leaves. Can you tell us about that? Oh, definitely. So on the nutrition side, there's actually more potassium in raw hemp leaf than there is in the same amount of banana. So while people eat banana for nutrition, that's just to give you an example. And there's actually in the same amount of, say, 100 grams of milk and 100 grams of hemp leaf, there's more calcium and protein in the hemp leaf than there is in the milk. Um, and so it's just in it's basically a super food. Um, as and I like to say, the, it's a super food that needs a super cape. <laughs> it's just insane. Um, the more you know, and like eventually I'd like to get into, ex- because unfortunately everyone likes extracting everything and getting to I- protein isolate because there's so many uses for that mm-hmm. in plant proteins and things, but that requires a whole other approvals. But in the short run, the, the leaf by itself can be, I mean, What's insane, what's interesting to me is we're giving it to chefs and seeing what they create with it because anything I could, I, they've gone beyond anything I could ever imagine. They're making kimchi with it. They're making, um, they're putting it in sandwiches. They're dehydrating it. They're putting it in batter and deep frying it. They're um, putting it on sandwiches and burgers on uh, in with eggs with, it's just, um, you know, uh, for wraps for, with like sh- uh, shrimp ceviche um, you know, there's obviously you could use it in stews. You could, I mean, that's what's interesting is like any way you'd use a herb or a salad green or you can use. And so, it's, and it's versatile between the use of, because it's not just a microgreen. It's also can be, there's like, I mean, basically we're going between micros, babies, and then mature. And so you have this, uh, you start getting slightly different consistencies. And so when you're doing things like deep frying, you'll want to utilize a, a, a bigger, um, firmer leaf. So that we, it'll actually hold up in the batter, for example. Yeah. And there was, there's a great chef, um, Mike Magliano. He works with like pantry, which is a recreational cannabis company, but he also is developing um, plant-based foods and things. And so we've been, he's been using them and in, in a lot of, and he worked with, um, oh man, I, I apologize to all the great restaurants he's worked with because I should remember <laughs> their names. <laughs> okay. but, um, and so, and they're starting to put things like that on their menus. But again, corona, the COVID is kind of, that was originally what a lot of our launch was going to be around was restaurants because uh, early adoption happens with chefs and they drive that. He, the home market and retail is just a lot harder to scale and get acts and get people to buy into. It's a, when you have that experience with food in a restaurant, I feel like it uh, exposes you to new ingredients in ways that you can't do because of the same problem is how do you explain to people how to use it? We're accumulating recipes and things now to start a cookbook specifically for hemp leaf because, because of this. Um, but again, honestly, just um, on our Instagram, not our person, not our actual company images. I mean, some of them, but if you look at who's tagged us, there's some amazing things in there. Um, Chef Holden Yeager is another one. He actually did a show with um, uh, Gordon Ramsay, where Gordon Ramsay went to San Francisco and they, and a few other chefs from Europe and they, uh, you can see it on YouTube. uh, And they actually, um, they infuse some food, but uh, they also use the leaf on a few of the dishes, like the uh, tea, because they did a high tea and used it for the uh, tea sandwiches and things. And it's it's just interesting to see, because I think he actually salted, dried, and cured and candied the leaves. And so that's, I mean, like, it, 
Yeah, I, we're also, I have, I'm currently pickling some for experimentation in my fridge myself. I am, I am just so lit up, brother. I, I, this is just so fantastic. And of course, the other thing about the early adopters being the restaurants is that then people come in and it, it, they see it. Not only is it giving them the idea of what to do with it, but they're, it's liberating them to do something with it. It's, it's the, it's really just setting, making the public setting where it is okay. Uh, let's try something new. It's delicious. It's nutritious. And, while you tell us about the calcium um, and the potassium uh, quantity and comparisons, and thank you so much for that, such great information to have. I often, and I go off, as you know, I uh, have a grain processing facility, uh, hemp seed runs my life, um, and I, the, the incredibly nutrient-dense profile of, of the hemp seed blows my mind. And of course, I when we talk about it being the highest digestible form of protein, that seed, because of its lack of trypsin inhibitors, it's basically full profile of amino acids, maybe a little shy on the lysine there. And the fact that generally speaking, and when we speak about hemp, everything is generally speaking, uh, the hemp seed is about 60% edistin protein, which is a globular protein far far better to be absorbed and more easily absorbed by the body than these more fibrous proteins uh, that are in uh, wheat or soy or beef or chicken. Can you tell us any comparisons, kind of the way you did with the potassium and the calcium um, in terms of, of the protein content? So I've got, generally speaking, three tablespoons of hulled hemp seeds is going to give me around 10 grams of digestible, digestible protein. Any way to sort of to sort of tell us about that with the leaf so the difference it's a it roughly equates to about a third as much when it's fresh when it's dry it's relatively the same that's some of the bigger differences is that there's a lot more water weight it, so it also depends on whether you're talking about so the like i was saying it's because the fresh produce has a lot of water weight and so it's a lot uh a lot less dense than the seed but for example, dry leaf powder mm -hmm. uh, ends up having around 20% uh, total protein, uh, which is roughly the same as, as seed. But the water weight and things like that is some of the bigger problems with the fresh, but the fresh produce has other, you know, with that you'll have higher flavonoids and other compounds that you don't get with this. It's just, it's, there's no, I don't think it's either or, it's both. It's and, both. Like, I mean, imagine, like things I want to see is eventually getting the essential oil approved as grass. And then you can have something where you have the, the leaf salad with hemp grain in it with, you know, maybe a hemp mozzarella in there and then like a hemp oil dressing with an essential oil in it. I mean, that's like that's the future I want to see. And that's the future that's coming. And of course, uh, hemp is also the great blender, right? I know in the 90s, we had these visions of this 100% hemp world and every farm was going to be all hemp all day, all the time. And all the paper was going to be hemp and everything's going to be hemp. And of course, that's a monoculture and it's boring, particularly uh, diversity is what gives the earth plane its uh, character <laughs> and uh, and keeps us evolving. Um uh, but but also, I, I think that the bottom line is hemp is a tremendous blender and synthesizer for industrial purposes, for nutritional purposes, for animal and human purposes. It is a great uh, synthesizer. It is so tremendous what Z's Farm is doing, the inroads that you're making, just the, the, the permaculture flower, I guess I would say, that you are affecting um, with this, with your vision. Um, and with your intellect and absolutely with, you know, the force um, and dedication by which you advocate uh, for this plant in all of its forms, David, it's just such a pleasure um, to have you on the show and, and sharing this incredible work with us. I want to ask you in the, in the time that we have left, first of all, is there something that that I didn't ask you, or that you a, a message you may want to make sure the listeners know or understand about hemp in general, or about what you do? Oh, um, I could touch on my other company really quickly, um, please. Which is a complete completely different direction. Um, we, I actually just got noticed that my first patent has been issued. 
so it'll it'll actually be issued on technically on December 29th because they issue on Tuesdays. Um, and so I'm excited for that. And it's for agricultural treatments on cannabis. And um, we're working with some large ag companies, which I can't name due to NDAs, but and the EPA to do the testing required to bring those to market. These are all things that are used on other crops. It's just figuring out the, the you know, the ratios of different things. And we've been able to induce a higher cannabinoid and terpene yields or alter the cannabinoid and terpene uh, consistency, you know, makeup of the of the ratios uh, in the flower, uh, utilizing different treatments. And so I got those pat that patent awarded, and we're, there's a few more in the series that'll be coming. Um, and so the goal is just to try and it, it's the same thing you do with grapes or anything any other crop is to try and improve it through the cultivation methods. And so we're excited to to see that start getting uh finished and then to hopefully by it'll probably be more like 2021 but have something that farmers will be able to actually purchase and utilize in their fields to uh to increase the the quality of their crop so it's something i'm excited about i'm so excited for you and what i mean talk about a grand finale in case you didn't understand <laughs> how fantastic uh david uh is with the basic and simple however complex and nutritious hemp leaf he also you know in his spare time invents stuff and then has patents issued you are incredible brother it's just such a pleasure um and thrill really to to watch the lotus petal um lotus petals unfold of of heroes and heroines like you david and i can't wait to have you back on um and as the legislative session for the state um gets ready here and comes online i sure hope that we'll be spending more time uh talking with each other about the regs here in washington state since I moved back here uh, in March after doing some great work in uh, New York for two and a half years, actually more involved in what's going on in New York than than ever before. We're in a prop regs phase there too, but I really am looking forward to um, working with you on a deeper level and uh, we'll do everything that I can to spread the good word about Zeese Farms um, and about the tremendous work you're doing to feed the world and to feed the animals. David, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, it'll be great to uh, to work together on the Washington laws. And I have to assume you were involved with helping getting New York to allow hemp into their medical system, so that uh, medical cannabis system. So that that's that's something I'm excited about for New York. Since just since you mentioned New York. Yay. No, no. Very great things happening there. Very favorable climate there. And and we just have to say, uh, Washington saying, oh, no, what, whatever the FDA is saying, we have to do. And then you've got the great state of New York, which really prides itself in, on being the gold standard. And they, in the face of what the FDA is saying, is saying, we're doing it here. So something tells me, and I know for a fact, actually, your product will fly there. And if you ever need assistance there, I'll do everything that I can to work those relationships. David, have such healthy, happy, and hempy holidays. And we'll have you again on Hemp Baron soon. Thank you so much. Have a great holidays. Thank you. 